So yet another new generation of Pokemon came out, which means there's another new generation of potential criminals to be discovered within our Pokedex. People like to ask for updates on my war crime videos on a confusingly frequent basis. However, Pokemon's new batch of lovable yet terrifyingly apocalyptic goons seems to have enough new stuff to talk about that I think it's worth taking a look at. Plus, there's a few concepts I never elaborated upon in the first video that may be neat to fully talk about here. So I'm not going to bog you down with all the required knowledge, as this is a sequel and we've done this enough times to know what's going to happen. Yes, wars that involved or utilized Pokémon are canon, and yes, the Pokédex is stupid and probably shouldn't be looked at in depth under the lens of treaties that were only created in the last century after great loss and tragedy in the real world. However, I think that Zigzagoon canonically committing a war crime is kind of funny, so I'm going to continue on my comic antics. Although, before we jump into the newest games, we actually have to take a look at Raid Shadow Legends Arceus. I couldn't run with the joke. There was a few new additions thrown into the mix with this game, but there wasn't really enough to warrant their very own video. Also, while we're on this note, there's no video sponsor this time around. But if you want to check out these links on screen, that'd be pretty neat. And I guess while I'm breaking video flow, I'm going to be using a lot of online footage as recording Generation 9 of all games on a Switch Lite is suicide. So also feel free to check out and or send support to the creators on screen. Okay? Okay. To start us off, Quillfish is back at it again with its comic antics, spraying poisons from its spine haphazardly. Which, as always, violates the restriction of poison and poisoned weapons. In fact, just like the last video, let's go ahead and get all the poisonous candidates out of the way, as utilizing poison and or poisoned weapons is something that is restricted entirely. So there's Hisuian Sneasel, Sneaseler, Pouty and Wooper, although its Pokedex entry is a near copy-paste of the default Wooper, Shrewdle, its evolution Graphii, and my favorite of all of them, Glamora, who has a damn poison laser beam which it charges and fires up with its petals, which is pretty fucking metal, actually. But with all that out of the way, Gudra is usually a very calm and loyal slug dragon. However, its Hisuian form is extremely clingy and loves solitude. So with those that are dearest to it ever leave its side for whatever reason, it will fume and run riot. This exact behavior is also referenced in Paldea now, where even modern-day Gudra are referenced to rampage and become uncontrollable with surprising force. So, I would easily consider this an indiscriminate attack. And for reference, I mentioned this a lot in the last video, but an indiscriminate attack is an attack that is not directed at a military objective, and or consequently affects civilians without distinction. So, for future reference, any Pokémon that are known to rampage and or negatively affect a civilian population, whether that be the damage or destruction of resources, homes, infrastructure, land, or even just the civilians themselves, are going to be whacked with the ban hammer. Up next, though, is Zorua and Zoar Ark. And I need to talk about these two together because they're kind of special. Zoroark supposedly looks like an embodiment of death itself, and it's so heedless of its own safety that it lacerates its own body by attacking its nemeses with intense, bitter energy. This dude definitely listens to fucking Nightcore playlists because it's very literally cutting itself with its own edge. On a more relevant note, though, they both retain their transformative abilities and can take on different forms. However, in Hisui, 
Generally, they're both kind of assholes, and they tend to transform with lingering malice and resentment. And because of that, I'm throwing them both under perfidy. Perfidy will be discussed a little bit later with a future entry, but to briefly mention it now, Perfidy is a war crime as if you are unable to differentiate civilian and combatant, ultimately civilians are going to be harmed. Espionage, <laughs> spying, and other ruses of war aren't strictly prohibited, but pretending to be a civilian for the sole purpose of harming or assassinating people is. I will concede that there are, like, a trillion caveats in that one sentence alone. When it comes to anything that revolves around deceit, there kinda has to be. Like, here's a website I found with a bunch of really useful information. Here's a scroll through their page on indiscriminate attacks, for example. And here's a casual scroll through perfidy. Yeah. Regardless, though, it's safe to say that Zoroa and Zoroark definitely violate specific regulations on perfidy. Fortunately, though, in comparison, Voltorb and Electrode are extremely simple. If you make Voltorb happy, it's going to discharge electric currents that can harm those around it. However, if you make Electrode angry, it's going to do the same thing, but let loose a current equal to 20 goddamn lightning bolts. You really can't win with these two. But, still, indiscriminate attack. And lastly, Enamorous not only brings the end of Bitter Winters, which I'm going to interpret as illegal weather warfare, but it also ruthlessly punishes those who treat any form of life with disrespect, which is... rather vague. So, I'm just going to count that as two different strikes on indiscriminate attack, and move on to Spain. Weedcat. Firstly, it stood up, which should already be a crime in of itself. Yes, I am rather resentful, but secondly... Its first form mesmerizes those around it with a scent that its body gives off. Which I would normally say is fine because mesmerize and mesmerizing are words that are used very liberally in the Pokedex. However, since its evolution rigs its foes with pollen packed bombs which it sets off before the opponent realizes what's going on, it's going in the unofficial watch list here. Meowskareta doesn't really get that luxury, though. It's utilizing illegal biological weapons for sure, however, due to the fact that they're also goddamn bombs, I'm going to qualify it as a cluster munition, which are heavily regulated and are even flat out prohibited in many nations. So, with these two concepts combined, Weedcat is going to jail. On the other hand, the Flaycoco line is pretty basic, though. They spew fire all over the place, with Skeledurges reaching well over 5400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, uh... scary. So fire and incendiary weapons were another recurring topic in the last video, and to elaborate on that because there was confusion, one thing I do a lot in these videos, which I maybe shouldn't do, is generalize laws around the entire world instead of zeroing in on a specific country or location. There's quite a few reasons why I do this. Despite many popular claims, Florida and the Distortion World aren't quite the same. But on a relevant note, let's take a look at nukes. So, a lot of countries in the world aren't really fond of nukes... existing. And I can't really blame them. Ever since their invention and production, all it takes is one man for the entire world to end as we know it. So, because of that, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was produced and currently has 91 signatories. Do you know who is noticeably absent from all the signatures, though? 
the countries that have nukes. And it's likely that none of them will ever sign it as having enough firepower to end the planet is kind of intimidating and mutually assured destruction is a hell of a concept. So because of that, in the few instances where nukes have been brought up, a la BTD-6's Sarbamba, I have never addressed nukes as illegal despite the valid concerns and claims. Likewise, incendiary weapons, as well as pretty much most war crimes, have a lot of variation. For example, a flamethrower has many legal and practical uses in war, such as clearing out dense foliage around a military objective. However, if that process leads to civilian casualties or an out-of-control wildfire, you're gonna be in a lot of fucking trouble. I mean, hell, even the United States, the masters of it's not a crime if we do it, have a threshold where you can only utilize incendiary weapons against military objectives, where it is judged that alternative weapons would cause more casualties or collateral damage. So with all that out of the way, let's get back to the fire crocodile and why all of this somehow matters. Fire isn't strictly bad. Like I said, there are a lot of scenarios where fire is really good. Fire that is uncontrollable, or fire that spreads slash spews haphazardly though, is abysmal. So our interior crocodile alligator is going straight to no-no land. Up next though, Spidops covers its territory in tough, sticky threads that serves as traps against intruders. I actually don't know if I covered this in the last video, but as a baseline, you need to assure that any feasible precautions to possible civilian incidents are accounted for and respected if you want to lay traps. For a brief example, if you want to place down landmines, you need to track where you placed them down so that they can be disarmed later. Failure to do so will almost always result in civilian casualties. And, as a fucked up little statistic for you, approximately 80% of all landmine casualties are civilians, with children being the most affected. Yeah. So we'll cover more elaborate rulings later. But judging by the second entry, which states that it takes out its prey before they even notice it, I'm going to go ahead and say that there may be a likely chance little Timmy may accidentally walk into a goddamn spider trap. For the next entry though, I'm just going to go ahead and break the rules as this actually isn't stated in the Pokedex, but it's a personal attack that I will not stand by and take idly. Grievert is my dog. I know it's designed after an entirely different breed, but for all intents and purposes, it looks identical to Bug right before his haircut. So when I read the entry and figured out that it's the most loyal dog Pokemon in a series full of loyal dog Pokemon, and it likes to follow you around forever because it dislikes being alone, I fell in love instantly. It's just like my puppy, who I have right behind me. Isn't that right, Bug? Isn't that right, you little man? I'm giving him belly rubs, you can't see this, but I'll provide a visual on screen. Yeah, so go ahead and imagine my feelings of utter shock, disbelief, and horror when Game Freak just casually dumped the fact that being around this dog kills you. Why must you do this to me? I thought we had something. We've been so close. I'm sorry, Bug. Flittle. If anybody, quote, steals its berries, it will chase them down and exact its revenge. You can't attack a civilian that is not taking direct part in hostilities. And although you can make the claim that it's pillaging and hence action can be taken against them, I don't know if it's possible for Flittle to lay nests or otherwise produce... homes? 
problem, Flittle is a damn bird who doesn't understand the concept of property tax, so I don't think this is happening, but rather, Flittle is just a vindictive asshole who can't understand the concept of sharing natural resources. On a slightly relevant note, Wug Trio has a vicious temperament and is known to wrap its long bodies around its prey to drag it into their den. When you take a look at the real-world animal that this takes inspiration from, the hunting technique lines up. I'm going to go ahead and say that if this thing considers humans as prey, this may very well qualify as an illegal booby trap. And I normally wouldn't claim that it might be because there is a really crippling loophole when it comes to Pokemon. You can't design traps that are associated with animals or their carcasses. So when a Pokemon is their very own trap, it kind of doesn't line up. However, the fact that it specifically outlines that it has a vicious temperament kind of has me worried. Really what I'm getting at here is that when the Garden Eels gain sentience and officially declare war on humanity, they have a very exploitable advantage against us. Scovillain frequently goes on rampages, and when it starts its indiscriminate assault, there is no stopping it. It also converts spicy chemicals into fire energy and blasts the surrounding area with a stream of super spicy flame. I don't really know what spicy flame is, I sometimes call lava spicy water, but I'm willing to concede that it's not a scientifically accurate nickname. At least to me, somebody who is totally unbiased to the war crimes of the Pokemon universe, it kinda sounds like the chemicals that are added into the fire cause indiscriminate suffering, and would hence just be entirely outlawed. Tatsugiri so remember all the way back in Hisui when I mentioned perfidy would be discussed later? Yeah, so guess what? Zigzagoon made a friend. So if you don't know, Zigzagoon was the only Pokemon that was known to feign death by the time the original video released. However, I cut out the reasoning as to why feigning death was a war crime, as the video was covering eight generations of Pokemon, so I had to cut some corners and condense a lot of things for the sake of time. I wouldn't say that it was a mistake in retrospect, but a lot of the most popular comments on that video related to that decision. First, people demanded that I release the Zigzagoon cut. Then people asked why I would cut it out, as it was an intriguing point to add to the video. Then people started asking why Zigzagoon was convicted, but Vulpix was excluded, despite also feigning injury in battle. So today, I'm going to put all these questions to rest. I already kind of talked about why I cut out the segment, but the difference between Vulpix and Zigzagoon is in intent. Vulpix does it to fool the enemy in order to escape, which isn't strictly prohibited. Zigzagoon does it in order to fool its foes and gain an edge in battle, which is an entirely different story. So, to restate what I mentioned all the way back in Hisui, if tactics are used that make it impossible or difficult to identify a combatant, it's going to end in the loss of innocent lives. Feigning death, or really just perfidy in general, is one of those tactics. The rationale is that, if you know that an enemy is utilizing the wounded or dead to gain an edge on you, an appropriate strategic response to that would be to shoot anybody or everybody you see on sight, and or a reluctance to take prisoners or otherwise show mercy. So, predictably, in areas where these tactics would be utilized, this led to very, very aggressive and merciless behaviors and a lot of innocent people who may have not even been involved in the war would pay the price for it. So, it was entirely banned. So, Tatsugiri, just like Zigzagoon, feigns weakness and death in order to trick its opponents to gain an edge. 
and even takes it a step further by ordering their partner to attack the deceived foe shortly thereafter. You know, an ambush. The same exact tactics that led to it being banned in the first place. Oh, yeah, two more things before we move on. I forgot about the Zigzagoon cut. I, uh, I kinda don't have the original video files anymore, so it's... It's not gonna happen. I'm sorry, apology video coming out next week. But, uh, more importantly, for Tatsugiri, the stretchy form as of current doesn't actually have any references to perfidy. So, I, uh, I gotta pull up this tier list again to put Tatsugiri in there. The other two forms are going straight to fucking jail, but uh, this one can stay. For now. Up next, Bombardier. Firstly, that name is a perfect 10 out of 10, but secondly, Bombardier enjoys dropping objects from high places, particularly things that make loud noises. Indiscriminate Attack. Knackle Stack. Knackle Stack dry cures its prey by spraying salt over its victim and stealing away the water within them. What the fuck? Yeah, so I'm just going to label that as a weapon that causes superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. And normally I'd be a bit hesitant to give out that ruling, but here's the thing. Knacklestack's other Pokedex entry basically just reads that it has a built-in gun. So this thing has access to what I would consider a pretty ethical and legal weapon, but instead, it decides that's just going to slowly drain away all the water in its victim's body in a process that I can only assume is extremely painful. It also doesn't really get much better if you were to assume that it kills its enemies with its polka gun before curing them, as that would still be a violation on the treatment of the dead. That being said, though, it does luckily have a redemption arc as this Minecraft creature evolves into an even bigger Minecraft creature which happily heals injured Pokémon. So that's nice. And on a similar note to Knacklestack, here's the Bed of Chaos. It envelops its prey with its thorny branches and then proceeds to absorb all of the life force it requires before discarding it. Again, Treatment of the Dead isn't looking too hot here. It gets better though, as there have been recorded instances of mass outbreaks of Bramblegasts burying entire towns. It's been a hot second, but I think this is one of, if not possibly the only instance of the Pokedex just casually admitting that a Pokemon is known to commit ruthless massacres against entire local populations. Quite a few inadvertently or directly lead to that. Morality is subjective, but I'm willing to concede that I think destroying the planet with lasers is a bit worse off on the morality chart. But usually there's a bit more subtlety. If you spell subtly like this. Usually, if mass destruction is involved, they keep the effects on humanity vague or they make the cases extremely specific. This thing is just known to destroy entire towns and presumably absorb all of the inhabitants that stick around before discarding all the destruction that it left in its wake. This may very well be in the top 10 worst Pokemon in the entire series, which is a genuine achievement to give out at this point. I hate it. Good job, Game Freak. Gimmagool, I'm just going to go ahead and say, is utilizing an illegal booby trap. It sucks the life force of anybody who tries to, quote, steal its treasure, which is... fine...ish? On paper? But the problem is that it's addressed specifically in the roaming form that it survives by draining the life force of humans. Which leads me to believe that it is intentionally alluring people with its coins before attempting to kill them. Upon the many restrictions on what you can attach a booby trap onto, 
There's also a general law that outlines you can't utilize any trap that is in the form of an apparently harmless object that detonates once approached or disturbed. See a Penny Pick It Up isn't supposed to be a precautionary song on the horrors of war, so this thing is a violation. And, of course, all the precautions that you need to take in laying down and or deploying traps are also violated because Gimmigool is an asshole. The treasure chest form isn't much better either, as I think a chest is normally, traditionally, a pretty harmless object. Most of the time. I know the Pokedex outlines scoundrels in particular, which gives you the implication that it's hiding in places to lure in scoundrels, but it doesn't. It's actually found in stores a lot of the time. And I'd easily imagine people just instinctually opening it without any intent on stealing anything. Or even expecting to find anything inside. As a person who lives near a bunch of antique stores, Opening up containers just to see if anything is inside them before immediately closing it is practically second nature. Humans just like the curiosity and suspense involved in opening something. I don't really know. Iron Jugulus exists because a Hydragon fucked a robot. That is all. Tinglu, Qian Pao, and Wo Qian all cause massive natural disasters, which I'd all label under indiscriminate attack. Tinglu creates massive fissures, which obviously damages the land and possibly its inhabitants. Qian Pao creates avalanches, which likewise can cause significant damage to an area. And Wo Qian drains the life force of nearby fields and forests, which causes them to instantly wither away and turn barren. Which would also be considered a terrible biological weapon. Also, specifically on that last point, there's a bit of a recurring theme in this video that I've been keeping track of subconsciously, and that's Game Freak's inability to just say murder or kill, or otherwise directly involve death in newer entries. This generation is just non-stop draining the life force of, or stealing the nutrients from. Game Freak, you have several Pokémon that are well known to regularly commit infanticide, even more that are regularly known to commit child homicide, and even more are known to kill innocent civilians on a regular enough basis that it's specifically mentioned. You can say death words. You don't have to try and be subtle. Of course, we're spelling subtly like this, but you can be direct in your intentions here, I promise. Alright, uh, what's our next entry? Koridon splits the land with its bare fists. Regigigas enjoyers are now in shambles. All four of them. Including myself. Miraidon, though, turns the land to ash with its lightning. Meaning that it and Zekrom are probably just the best of pals. Tinkaton plunders whatever it pleases to bring back to its home. Considering the fact it's just casually wielding and swinging a 220-pound hammer, it's probably doing that by intimidation or by force, which is going to be a violation on the prohibition of pillaging. And with all that, we're done with Paldea and we're done with Hasui. But of course, as always, a bunch of previous Pokémon make a return in both games, so I'm going to cover some updates here as well. Specifically on any Pokémon that have new and unique entries worth discussing or displaying. So starting off in order of the Paldea Pokédex, firstly, for an absolutely incredible start, Jumpluff has been updated to fucking perish. No, seriously. They just updated the Pokedex entry to specifically state that the spores it creates now racks people with coughs and itchiness, and when its journey ends, so does its life. Why? Out of any Pokemon to just casually turn into a suicide bomber, why Jumpluff? 
What they do to you? I'd like to just commemorate a moment of silence for our fallen cotton friend today. They lived a good life. Thank you for everything, Jumpluff. I'll miss you. Anyways, for a much less depressing and simple entry, Charcoal now rolls around frantically while spewing flames which exceeds 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Which I'm going to go ahead and say is a bad thing. Especially because they like to hang out in mines which are, uh, man-made. Crabominable is now a popular food, and apparently some trainers bring Lechonk into the mountains just to search for them, which is, uh, gonna work out real well, I'm sure. Although more relevantly, it now blows icy bubbles from its mouth to immobilize its opponents, which is just a really, really bizarre development. Dude went from ha ha ha, yes, I have exceptionally powerful fists and can punch really, really hard, to getting hard countered by an unevolved pig and blowing bubbles. Huh. On a similar note, though, Salazzle got a really, really bizarre update. So, I went ahead and considered mind control of any variety of crime, as you can categorize it as a violation under several regulations. However, Salazzle was noticeably absent from that video. It utilizes pheromones to captivate male Salandit into loyal servants and eventually start a harem. Which isn't me making the Pokedex entry sound more dramatic for flair, it literally, verbatim, forms a harem. However, the entries only referenced male Solandits being the target, so I ultimately let it slide. Since then, somebody over at Game Freak decided to, uh, damn. This shit's kinda hot. Hey boss, let's, let's make this cannon. <laughs> oh, fucking Christ. He's making me question things about myself. Smash. Look, it's got tits! It's guy that's jutting its tits out. It's 100% female. 100%! And then they made a cannon. This may be the worst development of this entire series, which... says a lot. Anyways, getting off of that topic immediately, Forges devotes itself to protecting gardens and is extremely territorial of them. However, in the newest game, and I quote, Though usually compassionate, Forges will hunt down anyone who vandalizes its flower garden, showing no mercy even if they beg for their lives. How quaint. Gudra, as I previously mentioned, now rampages uncontrollably when enraged with Vicious Force, which is a fun new addition to the anger management tier. Up next, the Pokemon conspiracy theorists are back at it again, as Fungus is a bit of an anomaly, as nobody really knows why it resembles a Pokeball. So in light of this, theorists now propose that the creator of the modern-day Pokeball really liked Fungus. If this somehow gets confirmed in a later Pokedex entry, you have all of the ammunition to use against me that may very well disqualify Fungus, or really any of the Pokeball-related Pokemon, as an illegal trap. Or maybe it still is? Would we blame Fungus for not changing in a rapidly developing world where we modeled one of the most used technologies after it? Would Voltorb and Electrode be better as they're technically modeled after Funguses instead of Pokeballs? I'm having a hard time even attempting to summon an applicable metaphor. Poke philosophers are going to have a damn field day. Existential crisis aside, Pyroar now has a mad cargo effect going on where its mane burns up to 3600 degrees Fahrenheit and hence, even approaching it will now cause severe burns. Indiscriminate attack and an illegal incendiary weapon. Joy. Gothitelle, and I shit you not, 
unleashes psychic energy to show its opponents dreams of the universe's end as it has seen the end of all existence itself. It is clarified that the dreams are apparently beautiful, but that's not the type of shit you just casually dump on somebody. Honestly, torture slash cruel and inhumane treatment is something I probably should have mentioned several times in the last video, but making somebody forcefully witness the end of existence itself isn't particularly cool in my humble opinion, so I'm going to give Gothitelle a violation. Sinistee, as always, kills any person who attempts to drink it, appearing in hotels and houses to hopefully allure somebody to drink them so they can steal their vitality from within their host. However, its evolution poltergeist didn't share this trend. It did launch tea which caused chills if swallowed, but it wasn't as lethal as Sinistee. Game Freak realized that they made a mistake allowing personal growth, and clarified that drinking too much can be fatal. You could argue that this was implied since synesties are born from poltergeists pouring themselves into little teacups, but this was the first direct reference to its lethal properties. Plus, it's not stealing the life force from the drinkers, so that's about as direct as you're going to get with this damn game. Larvesta was worshipped as the Emissary of the Sun, which is just way too badass of a title for Larvesta to have in my humble opinion. However, it often caused forest fires, which, as previously mentioned, is illegal. Up next, Morgrim is another Pokémon that canonically commits perfidy. But this time around, instead of feigning death, it goes for a false surrender tactic. Morgrim gets down on all fours as if to beg for forgiveness, and if slash when an opponent is lured in, it stabs them with its spear-like hair. Grimmsnarl, however, just like Poltegeist, was never directly stated to maintain this tactic. Sure, Morgrim's signature move, rather fittingly titled False Surrender, is carried over and can still be used, but its Pokedex entry just talked about how cool its hair was. Game Freak yet again ratified this by clarifying that it still indeed does its comic antics, stating that even after evolving into its splendid form, God, I love how they describe this damn Pokemon, it hasn't given up on its petty misdeeds and pranks. Palisand also got a cool update. As always, it still drags helpless victims into its body to drain them of their vitality and their souls. And it still has a giant massive dried up bones within it from those it absorbed. But now, it also fires the bones of its victims from its little tower arms which I think is kind of just incredible. Nothing new is added, Desecration of the Dead still remains, but it's it's shooting the fucking skeletons of those it's killed out of tower hands. How is that not just incredible? I love it. I think I'm losing my damn mind, I'm just... I'm smiling like a fucking idiot reading this. Anyways, Gastrodon was always stated to be covered in mucus and purple ooze, but it was never stated to be harmful. In fact, for the longest time, it was only stated to be extremely sticky and squishy. Westsea, though, didn't like that fact and decided that its mucus should now be able to melt prey. And better yet, Gastrodon is just canonically racist now, so take that as you will, I have nothing to add. With the introduction of King Gambit as an evolution, Bisharp is now said to do anything to win. And judging by how merciless the entire evolution line is, anything may very well include illegal tactics. It's not said outright though, so... Where's the damn tier list? There. Moving on to the rest of the video with the Pokémon Legends Arceus entries... Bidoof. 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 Yeah, so I don't think I mentioned this in the last video, but Bidoof, just like Rattata and Raticate, both like to gnaw on things constantly. 
Just like the animals they're based on, their teeth continuously grow, and if they don't keep gnawing on things, there's a likely chance that they're going to literally die. However, unlike the rats, Bidoof wasn't stated to gnaw on civilian property or structures. Until Game Freak decided it was time for Bidoof to gnaw on civilian property and structures. It's not quite Bramblegast here, but by god, they made Bidoof a war criminal. What a damn achievement. They also did the same shit with Snorlax. Although I talked about him in the last video, in Pokemon Legends Arceus he just walks into villages and pillages their damn rice granaries. And apparently such occurrences have long been counted among the gravest of disasters. Thank you, Game Freak. After that is, uh... There's Gliscor? No, no, Gliscor is already kinda hinted at in its earlier entries. Is... is that it? Game Freak just decided to descend from the heavens to make Bidoof, and exclusively Bidoof a war criminal, and then left without any elaboration? Bidoof. Just Bidoof? I honestly don't really have a good way to transition out of this. Uh, I don't know how to start the outro, I'm kind of just amazed. Thank you, Pokemon Shadow Legends. Uh, I appreciate your existence even more than I ever thought I could. So, uh... Patreon. It's a thing I have, and I once again have to thank my amazing supporters for everything. Well, really, I have to thank everyone watching this for everything. I'm ultimately just a wacky street performer who does wacky things in an attempt to gain enough attention to sustain myself, but I digress. A slightly bigger and more parasocial thank you to Scremio, Alyssa, Teachy Boy, Andrew, Just a Plaid Shirt, Dan, Black Jade, Parabellum, Aiden, Jacob, Michael, Breadman, Catapultman1, Chair, Judge and Jury, Wubkitten, Teddy Bear Guy, Cray, Minister of Sauces, Mr. Bones, Frequent, Pyromusical, No Goat, Vegeta, and Blazeheart. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of my spiral into the depths of despair and shenaniganizing. If you want to check out some links, feel free to go in the description to click on some to boost your self-esteem, and another big thank you to the channels displayed on screen. Go check them out too if you so desire, just don't tell them I sent you. Please. I hope you all have a wonderful day, make sure to take care of yourself, bubbity bye.